on Capitol Hill, Congress is rushing to find out how to stop people across the globe planning to do the same. Lawmakers holding an urgent hearing about how ISIS and other terrorist groups weaponize the Internet to recruit over social media. David Gartenstein-Ross is here to talk about this threat. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, uh, and he testified uh, at that hearing that I just mentioned. David, thanks for being here. Just to, to, to touch on uh, Omar Qatar, um, I've seen criticism about his release from national security uh, experts saying this is somebody who has never renounced terrorism uh, and uh, this was a mistake. What, what can you tell us about Qatar? It's hard to assess him without having access to uh, where he is right now and what he's, he's saying to people. Uh, there certainly is a lot of controversy surrounding it, uh, but you know, for, for, I, ha I don't have the kind of information that I would need to really be able to assess that controversy. In terms of your testimony uh, today, you said that ISIS has been in a decline yeah. since October. So why has that not seemed to have a decline in recruiting? It seems like they're uh, being able to recruit people more than ever. Two reasons. One is that ISIS's major decline has been in the Iraq-Syria theater, and you know, their overall messaging strategy is one, it's a winner's messaging strategy. That's why sometimes the U.S. government's messaging about ISIS and ISIS's messaging are exactly the same. Both tend to emphasize the group's brutality, which is very romantic while they're winning, but not as romantic while they're losing. Now, while they've been losing in Iraq in, in, Iraq in particular, they've uh, expanded aggressively into Africa, and that's really switched the narrative from being about just Iraq to about their international presence. The second reason that it's not really well known is that they do a very good job exaggerating and sometimes manipulating the media, uh, even uh, convincing major media outlets that they control territory that they don't, such as the city of Derna in northern Libya. Interesting. Uh, obviously, social media has been a big way that uh, ISIS has recruited uh, and continues to recruit. It seems uh, clearer and clearer that this British ISIS fighter radicalized, in some ways, one of these Texas gunmen, one of these would-be terrorists who was killed uh, earlier this week. This uh, British ISIS operative has had his accounts on Twitter shut down several times. Do you think, for intelligence purposes, it's better to shut these accounts down, or is it better to keep them open so the U.S. and other Western intelligence agencies can monitor them? I think it's better for them to be shut down. And you know, this has been a big debate for a long time because there are legitimate concerns on both sides, the intelligence value versus radicalization potential. But we can now really have a very powerful test case in ISIS. You have far more foreign fighters who've gone to the Iraq-Syria theater than who went to Afghanistan during the entire course of the Afghan-Soviet war. It's been an enormous magnet, and uh, it's helped radical groups to really dominate the landscape within Syria. Uh, we can really see now the power of social networking in terms of mobilizing people to action, not just to radical thoughts. And in this case, Elton Simpson uh, previously had wanted to go over to Somalia and join Shabab. He'd been radicalized previously, but it seems that where Junaid Hussein came in was in spurring him to take action. To combat recruitment, uh, the, the Pentagon and other agencies of the U.S. government have tried to walk into the world of social media themselves uh, and discourage recruitment. How has that gone? Is it, is it effective at all, or is it considered kind of something of a joke? Uh, it hasn't been particularly effective thus far, as, 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 as far as most observers believe. Uh, a lot of the videos they've put forward have been uh, somewhat crude. Uh, the production values haven't been the best. Uh, but part of it, I, I, I'd caution that it's not clear exactly what they're trying to do, right? Uh, a lot of observers gauge it by, well, they haven't been successful in de-radicalizing people, but maybe their goal is to have more of a disruptive effect, and maybe they're measuring success based on di different metrics. What's clear, though, is that you know, ISIS is a foe that moves at the speed of social media, it can radicalize people, can get groups to join it, and the U.S. government is very bureaucratic. It has trouble competing in a communications way at the speed of the Gutenberg Bible, and that's a real problem. We're not really set up to compete in the 21st century field of conflict. What do you think is the biggest terrorist threat to the U.S. homeland right now? Does it remain Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is still strategizing and try to come, and come up with a, a, a big attack? Uh, is it uh, the Khorasan group? Uh, is it ISIS, lone wolves? What do you think is the most concerning? Lone wolves are the most likely, but also likely to do the least damage. In terms of the others, I mean, the real answer is we don't know. I mean, if I were putting my money, I'd put on the Horasan group, uh, but we actually don't know which of them is in the best position to launch an external operation that would hurt the United States. All right. All right. David Gartenstein-Ross, thank you so much. Appreciate it. As always.